Good yeah. Lord. So you, the, the biggest team you had was what, four people? Five, three, four, something like that. Yeah. Well, Lauren Carey was, was working with us. Uh, he, he came in to do a lot of the device control stuff. And uh, how many people maximum at Apple uh, uh, did you have? At which point? At, like at say, let's, let's just say App Final Cut Pro 5. Oh, I don't know. There had to have been... Somebody else would have a better idea. There were probably well, just 50 people, number. 60 people, something like that. 60? It depends on how you... That's a lot you, of management. It, but it depends on how, I mean, you know, because you get into, like, packaging and boxes, and you get into the marketing side, and, like, where do you draw the line at who's working on the app? But is it easier to work with four people than it is with 60 people? Well, from my side, it, the engineering side, I've always found that a team of somewhere between four and six or seven people is, for me, the optimum size to work on. Because it's you can move really quickly, like six or seven, four, four to seven people that get along with each other, that respect each other, um, and really collaborate well together. You can move really, really quickly and come up with a lot of stuff. Okay, so while you're at Premiere, you're going down to Hollywood. You're talking about you're talking to a lot of big wig yeah. editors. I mean, yep. there's some very famous people. Yep. What did you learn from them, and what did you want to put into your product because of them? I mean, we just we learned a lot of. I remember doing. Um, you know, the L cut, J cut, and three point edits, and um, the source record monitor stuff. Um, I mean, it was just, it was a huge slew of things that we learned over time. And, uh, and did anything all, that they say say, no, nah, I don't want to do that? Well, <laughs> I wanna, I would, I wanna, it, it wasn't the, I would, I would usually try not to look at, you know, what is this thing they're asking about? It's like, what are they trying to get to? And then what's the best way to get there? Because someone's always going to ask, what they see as you know the way to get from where they are to the end, but coming at it from not having it you know be something that I had been you know doing for such a long time, I sort of step back and say, okay, well you want to get over here, maybe there's another way to get there that's actually going to be easier. It might not be what you asked for, but it's going to get you there quicker. Um, that was what I always tried to do: is to uh, look for those kind of shortcuts and and different ways of looking at stuff. Ralph Fairweather, as you know. Um, he said, because you can say it much more eloquently than I did, and he always did, Ralph helped everybody on 2pop.com yeah. back in the early days when people had a problem with, uh, with uh, Final Cut Pro, and this would be at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he would answer it, but he would not only answer the question, he would answer it so eloquently, <laughs> and it was, just, it was absolutely beautiful. But he said that, and I think it was a, kind of a quote from you that it was it was the Final Cut Pro team's mission to put the tools of visual storytelling into the hands of everyone mm -hmm. who had a story to tell not just the gatekeepers of the major media outlets but yet you spend a lot of time with the gatekeepers of the major media outlets because they're they're doing things at the edges of you know production and so that gives you the ideas of the things people people might want to do that currently take 50 steps to get to where the result is something you want to end up with, but nobody, you know, sort of the starting side of things wants to go through those 50 steps. They just want to end up with the result. So figuring out how that you can just deliver them the result without them having to know anything about the steps in between. But did that kind of carry on through your your always. life with, with Apple? Always. Yeah, I, absolutely. I want to make it easy. I want yeah. to make it for that, that's everyone. That's always been my drive in this stuff has been people don't want to, I mean, they want they're using their software to be pleasant, but that's not what they want to do. They want to get to the end to be done and show off what their creation to people. They want to get there as quickly as possible with all of their ideas delivered. And so it was always building software to get them through the process as quickly as possible. That was always the, the goal. But as you know, all the pros said, I want to be able to do it by just me, and I don't want anybody else to understand what I do. <laughs> so, uh, but that was completely But the technology always does that. Technology comes in and, and takes away the barriers yeah and the, the but that was always that was always you I, I want I want to get rid of all that technology stuff that gets in your way mm -hmm. I want you just to be able to tell your damn story mm -hmm. yeah exactly I mean it, it, it's what and you got a lot of crap for that too so yeah, yeah. well whatever <laughs> uh, well, you, well you did I mean it's that just was, too bad but it, you did I, it was um, nice to have a company like Apple and that was kind of Apple's mission was to do exactly that in different ways and so it was a perfect place to be to get to do that and 
Apple's behind you saying, yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. Okay, well, so we're running out of, uh, well, I've got to skip this. All right, so uh, you're at Premiere, you went through version 4, and Macromedia comes a call in. Mm -hmm. And you're happy at Premiere 4, I was aren't burned you? out at Adobe. Really? I was really, I was, because we had been working, we had delivered four versions in four years. Oh. One of the versions we'd done in like 11 months. It, it was wasn't crank, one of those crank, two crank. years uh, Oh, no, no, cycles. no. This was, it was really like every fast freaking year. And, okay. and so I had actually taken a month off, and I got a call from um, oh, Bud Colligan at uh, Macromedia saying he wanted to have breakfast. Or no, it was actually John Doerr from uh, Doerr Associates. He was one of the board members that wanted to have breakfast. I was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy. And he convinced me to have breakfast with him. And then I had dinner with uh, he and Bud. And I wasn't sure if it was a good idea or not, but they, it was something that I knew that if I didn't try, that I'd be kicking myself not for trying it. And because they, they were, it was an opportunity to be a vice president, start a new division, you know, staff it, do whatever. And I uh, said, sure, yeah, we can do that in 18 months, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, four years later, we finally <laughs> shipped it in a different company. <laughs> so, so they enticed you how? I mean, just to come on over, let's do the same um, thing? Or it, it was, it was financially more something that I would have financially kicked myself better. for not trying, plus okay. the, the flexibility of being able to build a team. And, uh, you know. Now, they made you like a vice president or something mm -hmm. like that? Yep. Yeah. Which, that was a. That what was does a, that mean, vice president? It means you, you like, get to you're, sit you're in, in the exec staff meeting and watch the decisions of the company being made, and you realize that different people have different experience levels, and, but a lot of times they're just making it up and they're just like, yeah, we think we should go over here. Yeah, we think we should go over there. Looking, bad, or looking back, it's making informed decisions in a good direction and get moving there quickly. And you know that's about what it is about running a company, but I was so I was vice president. I was also managing the division, and I was doing a lot of coding. And <laughs> so that's somebody like, should that's have like seen three jobs. that's not a good that's, idea that's to put three that jobs in one person. <laughs> so we ended up there was a, a guy Will Stein that came in to do the management side. I kind of backed away from some of the vice president stuff because what I realized was I don't like managing people. Um, I like coding, and I like driving like the the vision of a team and the direction of a team. Um, and, and leading by, by doing lots of code and, and getting lots of good people around me to, do, to code with me on good stuff. What does chief architect mean then? It's, you're managing people, right? You're the guy who comes up with, so, uh, nope, I don't like this idea, I want I was this in idea. a very, very unique position at Apple. My title was actually DEST, which was Distinguished Engineer Scientist Technologist. It was a director level position. I only had one job in my entire time at Apple. It was the same job. Um, and But I had the... Typically, if you want to direct a project, the people have to report to you. I was in a very fortunate position that I had someone that I worked with who was the engineering manager that everyone reported to, but I still made all the decisions on what we were going to do, or the bulk of the decisions on what we were going to do, and was making a lot of design decisions and could drive things, but I could also code. I wasn't spending time like writing reviews and things. I could spend time coding and pushing stuff from the technical side. And Apple has a path like that, um, which is a good thing to do rather than a lot, of time, a lot of companies push engineers as they move up, they push them into a management role, which a lot of engineers are, want to be, you know, they're good engineers and they want to stay good engineers and they don't, don't want to have to become a manager to move up. Okay, well we have to uh, bang through this here now. Yep. Uh, you, uh, so Macromedia brought you over and it was a code name Key Grip, which is yep. this. And uh, you spent yeah. like three, four years there working on this product. Three years there. And uh, Michael Wall and Brian Meany and Tim Serta and some of the other guys in, uh, were, were there. And Andrew Baum were there too uh, at, at that time. Uh, and um, uh, finally in 1998, Tim Serta just showed you that uh, you went to uh, Las Vegas and demoed it, yep. and the the response was response was good. Was good. Quite good. We had we even though we were in room I don't know E E Z Z something in the back of the uh, thing, a lot of people came to look at it. It was actually an interesting because at that NAB, Steve Jobs actually gave the keynote, and as part of it, there was a demo of QuickTime, and as part of that demo, we were showing um, Final Cut. And so I actually, Steve, it was interesting, Steve's presentation was basically to all the broadcasters, <laughs> get all you guys need to shape. move forward because yeah, the exactly. computer industry is going to come and eat your lunch. <laughs> and, and that didn't go over very off. well with them, but, <laughs> but then backstage, that was the first point. I talked to him and he was asking me, um, you know, 
where did I live in relation to Cupertino and what would I think about you know, coming to <laughs> <laughs> having the project come to Apple because that was April and then in May we were down at Apple um, we knew at that point that we were going to get sold we thought it was going to end up being to a like to True Vision or to uh, like a video card company then so Apple um, I had friends at the time that said, why are you going to Apple? They're going to be out of business in a year. And I didn't necessarily disagree. Um, the, so we were, the next month in May, we were actually at the, you know, we all went down to the boardroom at Apple. And the uh, CEO of Macromedia told us, so unfortunately, as of tomorrow, none of you have jobs at Macromedia. And then Steve stood up and said, however, you have jobs at Apple tomorrow. <laughs> and there was, um, you know, it was a, they made it, uh, worthwhile for anybody who wanted to switch over, and there were 20 of us. I think 19 of us decided to go. The one person who didn't, she was, she and her uh, fiance moved to England. That was just a, but everybody wanted to move over and keep going with this. Now, thing. to make a long story short, uh, Apple bought you and the team. Bought they the would not buy Final Cut unless they bought software you and the software by itself is useless. It was just, yeah, it was useless. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> some way, it worked out, uh, and. Uh, like I said, get Andrew in a corner. He had a lot, to, <laughs> lot, to, lot to do with this and uh, uh, with the uh, with the sale. I, I, I don't. If it didn't sell, I, w would any of us be here? If it didn't, if Apple didn't buy it, because I don't think True Vision would have bought it. Media it, 100 wouldn't it have bought it. Down a whole they were screwing up so big time. They were. It, it was. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it was. It was absolutely. And you the right would thing be to developing furniture software. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so NAB 1999, that's when it happened. That was when the big demo happened. And guess who was the first demo artist? Paul Sacconi over here. <laughs> Paul Sacconi <laughs> was a systems engineer here in Los Angeles, and he got the software one week before Vegas and had to learn it and stood in, uh, in the middle of Brian Meany and, uh, and Randy Ubelos and gave the world its first look at Final Cut Pro 1.0 and as he says, boy was I nervous. <laughs> so that was uh, NAB 1999 and, uh, and apparently at the same time Avid uh, said uh, they're going to uh, uh, drop support for the Mac and a lot of Avid people that got all pissed it. off and went over to Final Cut Pro, that Apple's booth, gift. and looked at this, and it was a very, very busy booth for the entire NAB show. I'm just looking at that laptop there. <laughs> Wait, what do you see? Uh, what, what do you, look at that. Yeah. I love that. I mean, look at the size of that monitor. Yep. That's yep. like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and uh, well, and but, but the the iMac G3, the blue iMac sitting here, that was that that's was what the, we all started with. I that mean, that's was what, what I started Steve, with. Steve saw. And he knew that there was going to be this port on the front. That was that firewire. And there weren't that many developers for Apple because Apple was going to be out of business, as everyone saw it. And so Steve understood that it had to get developed internally and that software was going to be what drove the hardware. Well, it was, uh, and who came up with the price? Do you know? 990, was it Steve Jobs? I don't know. Because that, well, obviously that was huge. $999 mm -hmm. yep. plus plug your camera into uh, via firewire into your computer. That was it. Yep. That, that changed everything. And of course, Final Cut Pro had to have a commercial. And get uh, ready to lower the lights, please. Hi, my name is Randy Villas. I'm the technical lead for Final Cut Pro, a new video editing product from Apple Computer that'll be out soon. Um, this product combines the features that were previously only available in several different products all into one, very easy to use interface. I think it's going to dramatically increase the number of people who will be have access to creating great digital video. Um, it's going to take advantage of all the new technology coming out in the form of DV and all the new DV devices that are out there, um, which I think is going to really uh, create an explosion in the video market over the next couple of years. Final Cut Pro uh, takes advantage of all of the professional <laughs> editing features that you would expect in any uh, tool such as an Avid Media Composer. There's full support for three-point editing. Uh, there is drag and drop editing to make your editing support very easy. There is uh, detailed use of time code so that all of your clips are, um, you can get frame accurate control. Guaranteed audio video sync with any type of video source. And in addition to the editing features, you've got a full set of compositing features as well. So you really, it's as if you have an Avid Media Composer with about 50% of After Effects built right into the same interface. 
Hey, with the ease of use and affordability of Final Cut Pro, the only thing to limit you is your imagination. Oh my God. So why not express yourself with Final Cut Pro? <laughs> Okay, lights up. That's fun. Hey. <laughs> that was so awesome, Andrew. It was perfect. And, uh, of course, uh, while they were demoing... Uh, oh, no. Um, yes, we have oh, to show no. this. So it's like the, uh, the Disney ride. <laughs> it's it's uh, stuck in my head for another but, couple of years. But, but Paul, you did not show uh, um, this uh, tutorial software. You showed some of the DaVinci tutorial software. Uh, but this everybody remembers if they uh, <laughs> if they got Final Cut Pro. If you look at the Lindy Hop, you'll see a couple just moving. They're constantly moving. They go around a circle, mostly clockwise, sometimes, sometimes reverses. reverses. <laughs> There's a lot of reverse. stops, a lot of spins, a lot of boogie woogie steps. You use your whole body, you kick, you use your arms. You use your hips, you use everything in your body to accentuate what you hear in the music. Jump down, come on down, everybody's swinging. <laughs> and just a few days ago, I found out who actually produced that footage. Michael Wall, who is uh, Michael. Raise your hand and take the, take the blame. <laughs> it, it was great footage. It's just, I mean, anytime you have a set of footage that you're you know, testing things with and watching it over and over again. It's going to be stuck. I know, I don't think you wrote Final Cut Pro or Premiere or anything else for the professional market. You wanted it for everybody, right? You didn't want it for, it wasn't for a specific, for yeah, but market. you it didn't want specifically it specifically. Before. Well, this, this product came out in uh, around 2000 or something like that. And uh, bring the lights up a little bit. Um, Dan Fort is here, uh, uh, Rami Katrib is here, Tim Serta is here. These are the guys who became known as the guys who put the pro in Final Cut Pro because they turned this, they turned Hollywood onto this, this product. Uh, the ones who didn't want to use the $100,000 Avid systems anymore. And um, um, later on here with a, another slide, Dan Fort was doing a $3 million picture on a frickin' iMac at show, Showtime and uh, with Final Cut Pro. And uh, Rami, are you here? Can you just say a quick something about film logic so everybody understands if somebody can give them a microphone? I was working in a negative cutting company called Magic Film and Video Works. It was a place where you would walk in, there's 100 people working, when the door opened, the woof of all the film toxins would envelop you. <laughs> that was your daily affair. And uh, d Randy, what you did, how odd that would it, it would touch physical film. And <laughs> I'm learning so much about how you were exposed to it. But I was in that environment working in Telecine, and a client of mine said, hey, have you ever heard of film logic? By that point in time, I had already been completely possessed by the DV revolution. Firewire, I say that all the time, is what started the digital revolution. Yeah, yep. So I had a system at home, which was the blue and white Mac G3, which I think was the first product that Steve uh, uh, launched when he came back. Is that correct? Uh, he launched, yeah, the, the iMac G3 was, was first, or the iMac was first, and then the blue and white right. Power Mac G3. For the professionals. Yes. And all these years later, we're still waiting for something like that again. <laughs> um, um, so there I am at Magic Film and Video Works. Someone says, Film Logic, we're already completely hook, line, and sinker for Final Cut. I'm working in Telecine. Um, I get in touch with someone named Lauren Carey, um, which you mentioned that Lauren Carey. Is that the same Lauren Carey? Same Lauren Carey. He was doing device control software back years before, and we had hired him to do um, some plugins for Final Cut to do device control in Final, uh, sorry, in, in Premiere 3.0 or 4.0. He wrote a bunch of, the, he wrote the device control stuff. And so we had talked to him again for device far control left, stuff. Far left, far left, Lauren yeah. Carey. Um, that's, that's Lauren right and there. Then there he is. had been working on this stuff, and he, he saw to go and do the film logic stuff. So I convinced Lauren to come down to Magic Film and Video Works. He had never seen negative in his whole life, right? And, and it was really Dan. Dan was the, the mastermind because he was a real life editor. 
I was opportunistic working in Telecine, and I wanted to combine things like the Sony DV Cam Deck, which was iLink, which was the comparable FireWire protocol. And then we went through this whole test of using film logic, which gave us a KDL, a key code decision list. The origins of metadata, the little barcode on the side of the film. And the rest is history. Can we show the watershed moment, Rami? Rami, you want to show the watershed moment uh, that you might remember? This was at, uh, this is 2001 in February at, uh, at, at no, this was at Apple in, uh, in Santa Monica with a, it was an MPEG meet that Rami put together. That was it. editor. Let's uh, lower the lights, please. What we do is basically bring an expert from each field. We had the negative cutter, Edvin. Uh, we had Lauren come down. Um, and I had uh, my partner and I, who are, you know, the video people, the post-production people. And very briefly what we did is we went through the whole post-production workflow. We did everything that an avid show would do. We tr but the only, the only thing is that we weren't using bad SP, we weren't using avid. Uh, Final Cut and Film Logic are kind of, it's kind of a hybrid solution now where the two work together. And um, we're looking at ways that we can potentially make those uh, types of things easier and more streamlined and sort of cut out some of the bottlenecks. You know, like film support or media sharing, things like that. We want those to be right. One of the things that's been very successful about Final Cut is you go out, you buy a system, you buy the software, and it works. That was a lot of heavyweights from the Motion Picture Editors Guild who heard about Final Cut Pro who showed up for that meeting that Rami put together and everything changed. That and was a rough crowd. <laughs> and and, and, it, I, and it, was a, it was a rough crowd. Yeah, I, I have to say that the majority of the early years was mostly resistance or what I call nonchalantness. They were, we were completely dismissed. We, we were kind of an um, uh, oddity. Uh, Final Cut was not taken seriously uh, for many, many years, and were not for this community and all the supporters. It wouldn't well, you know, exist. It, it really wasn't many, many years. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Dan Fort and uh, Randy at, uh, uh, at Showtime shooting uh, Bojangles. This is 2001. It's a $3 million movie edited on Final Cut Pro. And this is the uh, assistant editor's iMac. <laughs> it was, it, he used an iMac. He did a demo at, Final, at uh, Lassie Pug with an iMac and, and an iBook. <laughs> and uh, it, it was amazing. Uh, this is Full Frontal at uh, Steven Soderbergh's, uh, uh, Steven's uh, in 2002. This is Final Cut at Sundance. This is Martin Boyd from uh, DVD Studio Pro, Bill Hudson, uh, Roger Ebert, uh, Daniel Fort, and Brian Meany. And uh, this is when uh, Final Cut is making big inroads. They had cut, they had cut 25 feature films prior to Walter Murch coming in to do uh, um, Cold Mountain. Little did you know. And uh, speaking of that, Walter Mertz walked into Digital Film Tree <laughs> and, and asked about Final Cut Pro. He says he's going to Bucharest and he wanted to use Final Cut Pro on an $80 million movie. And of course, Apple did not support him very well because it really wasn't, that wasn't ready good. for a feature film Because like supporting that. something like that it is a lot of work yeah. and a lot of energy, and but that just wasn't. Digital Apple's Film Tree decided to support them, and it ended up working out in the uh, in the in the in the best. So um, this should I show this? Do we have time? No, I don't have time to do this. Uh, Randy <laughs> Ubla. Well, well, Brad, is it okay? <laughs> okay. All right. So there are a bunch of new third-party integration Final items Cup that Pro we've 3. done. December First 2001 one is some new Boris uh, generators. One uh, Title 3D. First fact is that they're a generator, so they're no longer a filter that you're applying to something. They're actually a clip item that you can then manipulate, apply other effects to, and so forth as well. They actually show up in the little pop-up list in the viewer where the list of generators is. So you get those in there, and you get lots of Fonts. different effects. <laughs> Which are font support. Um, and so you've got all uh, kinds of different effects. You can even go over to a gradient for the effects as well uh, to get an idea what that's like and so forth, going from one color to another, um, as well as bezel and uh, either drop shadow or cast shadow as well. And uh, what's really great, I haven't actually selected that for that, um, is of course these effects, as what's going on down here in the timeline, are also in real time. <laughs> and. Uh, 
You know, Randy used to come down here a lot, along with uh, Paul Sacconi and a lot of Apple people. Used fun. to come down here a lot. I mean, almost every other month. Uh, well, uh, uh, Paul used to live down here, so he was here all the time. And then Final Cut became this really, really popular program, and Apple sort of squeezed the things. They didn't want the the. Uh, you didn't want Randy to do it anymore. You didn't want to demo it, or he couldn't. He he was not allowed to demo anymore. He was only allowed to demo in those big keynotes at Mac World. He was the only engineer, I believe, ever allowed while, yeah. to demo the software that you wrote. I was the marketing people who used to, when I was around. They right. always got really nervous with me because I was actually authorized to talk to the press. One of the few engineers. Yeah. It's authorized to talk to the press, but they, that made them really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve obviously really, really liked you. And uh, anyway, uh, Walter Murch came uh, and uh, demoed uh, um, his uh, uh, editing um, uh, of Cold Mountain. And again, that changed everything. And uh, I, I want to, you know, take us into the uh, the break with this. Uh, this was a, this was a big deal for a lot of people. Um, it made a lot of people happy, and, and uh, the last couple of days I, I, I posted this on the uh, Lapsy Pug Facebook page. Uh, a lot of you remember this because it, it made you happy, and I would love, I, I loved on tupop.com when people would freak out, there's a cow on my timeline, well, there's something so happening. The, we, we always wondered who was going to be the first one to see Bruce, and what was the reaction going to be, and how were we going to see it? They're freaking out. And, what happened was we saw this posting and someone said they thought they had a virus that because yes, exactly because they said the cow was kind of threatening <laughs> and we figured out the deal one of the quotes was 30 quat loose says it crashes on launch which is what one of the engineers said he coded something up and said ah this isn't going to work i bet it's going to it was a star trek reference i bet it's going to crash on launch well that had come up and the guy had you know something about crashing it was going to come up well um, the cow scene kind of threatening then became a yak bite in the next version of the app. <laughs> and uh, which I did not know, Randy actually coded the yak. Which, which I, you know, I, didn't do, I didn't do the graphics, but I coded all the animation. No, in fact, nobody knows, uh, seems to know, maybe Wall knows. Uh, is, even if Zalman Stern was the guy who said, we might as well all go herd yaks when he got frustrated without the, not shipping this Zalman thing. Zalman or Lewis? Uh, Louis, LaSalle. Louis LaSalle or Louis LaSalle. I think it was a Zalman. Zalman was also the, because we, we had given, he was, we called him Eeyore because he was just, oh, we're doomed. We had given him a little <laughs> Eeyore that had a little sign around its neck that said, we're doomed, we'll never ship. <laughs> but this, this, little, uh, this little yak made so many people happy. Websites uh, uh, sprouted up with all the sayings, and I believe uh, Philip, said there's like 111 something. When we started at Apple, there was a, about a month later, there was an all-hands meeting that was in the big quad outside, and we weren't able to tell anybody what we were doing at Apple or that we were even working there or whatever. We were up on the third floor, and there was a, this big th thing, and we were standing out in the balcony. We made this big banner that was a picture of Bruce, and it said, Yaks love IMAX. It was right after the iMac, and there are all these Apple employees looking up like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and we never told them. <laughs> anyway, you, you really made a lot of grumpy people, like I said, very, very happy with that, that, uh, that little goofy Good. Easter egg. And uh, one last thing before we uh, take you into the break, and I want you to, to uh, take the lights down. In June 2011, of course, when Final Cut Pro 10 changed and everything changed, or shipped and everything changed, um, we uh, debuted it in uh, London Super Meet with uh, Larry Jordan, and I ran back to Los Angeles to debut it here. We had Michael Wall um, debut it, and uh, because he had been on the uh, beta team for quite a while. And uh, this is to take you into the break. Lights, please. I'm going to do an audio-only edit. You see what's going to happen. I do an overwrite D, and oh. yeah, what? Uh, no, that was not what I meant. I said replace the audio, not the video. It doesn't work. There's no way to do that without basically doing a connect edit, manually deleting the audio from the source clip. It's a kind of a pain. Um, and uh, that's a shame. Just get used to using those connect edits. Oh, you're hissing? It's not my fault. I'm sorry. I'm just the messenger. No, I mean, look, connect edits are cool. They like you connect with your friends. You should, they're better. They're better. Then you don't destroy anything. <laughs> 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 
Please thank Randy Ubelos. Thank you guys for having me here.